Okay, we have here a good one from MIT 2025, quarterfinals, round three, problem two. We have the integral from zero to two pi of this sum with cosine in it, but the whole infinite sum is gonna be squared dx. Okay, I found this thing pretty scary at first. The idea of we've got an infinite sum that we've got to square out and then integrate it, it seems kind of impossible at first. Before I jump into it, I kind of want to just understand it better and maybe look at a simplified version. So without worrying about like all the constants and coefficients on this, we can think of this more, we can think of like a more simple form. If we, this is going to be inside something like cosine ax, cosine bx plus cosine cx. Now, of course, it's an infinite number of terms and we're squaring all of it. It's gonna be important in this that the a, b, and c values, these coefficients here need to be integers, but that's no problem, is in our problem, we got two to the n, that's always an integer. Now it's hard to think about squaring all this out, but we can, I mean, we know there has to be some simplification, so we can start looking at some different scenarios. Like, let's say we have just a cosine, I mean, everything when you square this out, everything's gonna be cosine terms, there's nothing else in here. So if we had an integral and we know our bounds are zero to two pi, and we just have an integral, like just take the first term, cosine ax. Well, I can just integrate this and we get sine ax over a evaluated from zero to two pi, but sine at zero is zero, sine at an integer multiple of two pi is zero. So the whole thing's gonna be zero and we know that we're gonna have a zero when this happens. So that's promising because we would definitely like to get rid of some terms. If we can zero some stump, if we can zero some of this out, then maybe we have something simpler to work with. The trouble is when we square this out, we're never gonna get just one term, right? We're gonna always have at least two cosines. So like, you know, we could just take a random one. Like let's say when we multiply out and we get a cosine ax times cosine bx, we're gonna have an integral. We'll have one integral that looks something like this. For this integral, we can use the different angle formula for a cosine which is gonna be, we'd have a one half that comes out front, still integrating this, it's just gonna be the sum of the angles and the difference of the angles. So it's gonna be cosine a plus b x plus cosine a minus b x. Now there is one important condition on this. We want a not equal to b. And that's going to be no problem because in our series, right, this two to the n, it's just going to keep growing to infinity. So we're never going to have two terms that are exactly the same unless we actually have the same, unless we actually have the square term where we have like cosine ax times cosine x. This condition is always going to be true. But if you split this up into two integrals, this is just going to be another integer here. This is just going to be another integer here. So we can use this. It's just going to each be an integral just like this. And so this first one is gonna be zero, this one's gonna be zero, and so this case is zero as well. So at this point when I was doing it, I was ready to just put down a zero for the answer, thinking we've zeroed everything out, but we do have to remember this case where this is not true, where we have the same angle, and that's gonna be when we have these square terms, but somewhere along the way, we're gonna have cosine squared ax, cosine squared bx, et cetera, for every single term. So we need to look at what happens for this integral. So for this one, you can just use the power reduction, or technically you could use that, but whichever. So we reduce it with this formula here, and we're gonna get, now the angle becomes doubled here. And then again, because we're adding, we could break this up into two integrals, but this second one, the coefficient here, again, is an integer. So we can go back to this, we're just multiplying by two. So this, when we separate this into a separate integral, that one's gonna be zero as well, and we're just integrating one. So when you do that, you're gonna get an x evaluated from zero to two pi. Evaluate the bounds, zero is nothing, plug in two pi, and this integral is always gonna be pi, regardless of what the a, b, and c are, every single one of them is gonna be pi. So we could kind of go back and start plugging in pi's everywhere, but I wanna be a little more careful with it just to kind of see what's happening. So to summarize all this, we got a whole bunch of stuff going to zero. This is the case where we can actually you know, usually you can't do this in algebra, right? Because if you have a plus b squared, let's say it's not necessarily a squared plus b squared. But in this case, it's true because all the other terms go to zero. And so we can just kind of distribute in 
the square and put it everywhere here. And so the same thing is true in our original problem. We can bring the square inside, squaring the cosine, and then also you need to remember to square the denominator. But now that we understand all this, I'll clean up the board and we can start on the actual problem because with this, it's actually really pretty easy. Okay, so to get started with this, what I'm gonna do is we'll rewrite it, but now using the fact that we can bring the square into the problem, first we'll do the denominator. So if I square the denominator, now we have two to the two n, but for two to the two n, I can write it as like this, two squared to the n, or just four to the n. So we're gonna have four, to the n here in the numerator, sorry, in the denominator. Now for the cosine squared, I mean, we kind of maybe jump and use this, but I wanna use our reduction on this. So, with, with, so without worrying about what's inside here, we have something like cosine squared alpha. Well, we have our formula here. And what we found is this part's not gonna matter because when we integrate it using this, it's just gonna be a zero. So all we need to keep from this part right here is a one half. So now at this point, what we have is something really simple. We could do the thing where we switch the series and the sum, but it's just, at this point, it's so easy, it doesn't really matter. So what I'm gonna do is, I will take this one half out front as a constant, and actually, let's bring it all the way out front, because it doesn't, because we can bring it out of the integral as well. But now what we have here, this is just gonna be a geometric series. With the half gone, I can write it as one fourth all to the n. But what that allows me to do is use the geometric series formula. If we look at this, like x to the n, when n's going from 0 to infinity, this is going to be just 1 over 1 minus x, as long as the absolute value of x is less than 1. But 1 fourth meets this criteria, so we can use our geometric series formula. So if we plug 1 fourth into this, we're just going to have 1 over 1 minus 1 fourth, this becomes one over three fourths, flip it, and we get four thirds. So all we're left with here, we have one half in front and we have our integral with just four thirds in front of it. I forgot a dx over here, but now we're just integrating four thirds, which is a constant. I'll actually bring that out. Four thirds times a half is gonna be two thirds. Integrating one, we just get an x evaluated from zero to two pi. Zero is nothing. Plug in the two pi for my final solution on this. We just get four pi over three and that's it. Okay, so now for this one, I'd really say all the work was in the pre-work. It was all in just understanding the problem basically because once we understood it, it was really just geometric series and quickly to a constant value. So not much integration. Anyway, that's it for today. Thanks everyone for watching. Have a good day.